first chapter by chapter study here, uh, and we'll be in Hebrews chapter 4. And uh, while you're there, let me, uh, uh, let me read off a couple verses here for Hebrews chapter, chapter 4. Um, it says this, it says that, that God's promise of entering his rest still stands. So we ought to tremble with fear that some of you might fail to experience it. Uh, for this good news, uh, that God has prepared this rest, has been announced to us just as it was to them. But it did them no good because they didn't share the faith of those who listened to God. For only we who believe can enter his rest. And for the others, God said, in my anger, I took an oath. They will never enter my place of rest, even though this rest has been ready since he made the world. We know it is ready because of the place in the scripture where it mentions the seventh day. Now, on the seventh day that God rested from all of his work. Uh, but in the other passage, God said, they will never enter my place of rest. And so God's rest is there for people to enter. But those who first heard the good news, they failed to enter because they disobeyed God. So God set another time for entering his rest. And that time is today. God announced this through David much later in the words already quoted. And so, Father, I pray that you would bless your words to our lives. And that you would send your Holy Spirit to lead us into following Jesus here this morning. I ask this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, well, if you're inclined to, to put a title on a message, today I've titled the message, Why Can't I Rest? Now, this is a real question. And, and unfortunately, it's a spiritual question. Because what God does is that he offers everyone to have peace with him. Jesus came into this world to seek and to save those that were lost. I raised both of my hands on that one, and God saved me. But it is only through, through Christ's death that we have peace with God. And, 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 and if I was to pull the audience, if I was to pull the room, I guess, this morning, that, that I would imagine that everybody would raise their hands and say, yeah, we know that. Well, if we know it so well, then why is it that we wrestle with having this rest in God? And so while God is, it is true that God offers us um, to have peace through the death of Christ, he also offers us to have uh, the, 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 that internal peace with the presence of his Holy Spirit within our life. That is also true. And again, you know, we're asking these questions to the church. You know, why do so many people struggle with resting in God? Why does that happen? Why, why is that anxiousness or that topsy-turviness happens within the, uh, you know, the core of who we are as people? We have some tremendous news here this morning because Hebrews chapter 4, it answers that question for us. And, 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 and while it is very true that Hebrews is a, is a super difficult book to teach, experienced pastors, commentators, they will all tell you the same thing about this, this book. In fact, on, on introductory weekend, when we opened up this book, you know, I made note of that right from the very beginning. But for us as a fellowship, as we're traveling through the book of Hebrews, listen, we're going to capture the big ideas that are set out in chapter by chapter by chapter in this. And, 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 and as we're capturing those big ideas in this, we're going to draw out the simple applications as well so that we can apply these things to our life. Because there's nothing worse than coming to church and having a, 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 a short fat guy with a beard standing up before you under the lights and telling you all these great things and all that stuff. And it's like, dude, I have no idea what you're saying, and I, have, I, I, I don't even get how that relates to my life. That's miserable to go to church like that. And I hope you don't have that experience today. I hope you see a, a tall, slender guy here. <laughs> oh, five foot nine and a half right here. The handsome beard. I cut it up for you last night. And even though I popped a button, I hope it's not related to my belly size. Maybe it is. <laughs> but I hope that you're able to get the big ideas and the simple applications. Does that make sense to you guys? Yep. All right. Well, let me remind you uh, why Hebrews was written. Now, the book of Hebrews here, this was written. Uh, I'm just saying this by the Apostle Paul. It seems to be like most, most of our scholars and commentators lean in that direction. So, I'll just throw that out this morning. While this thing was written by the Apostle Paul, it was written to second generation Christians. And these second generation Christians, as culture changed, as the intensities and the pressure, uh, if you will, across the Roman Empire, specifically up towards Rome, as all that began to heat up, if you will, 
that they were, they were in this place where they were challenged with the foundation of their faith. They were challenged. Listen, will I remain in Christ or uh, do, I, do I go back to Judaism to where I know that just sliding into that vein, it's going to reduce the cultural pressure. It's going to reduce the pressure amongst my family. It's going to move me into an area here to where it's a little bit more comfortable to live. They had that real question to answer. And what Paul is giving to them in the book of Hebrews is he's saying, listen, man, everything is better with Jesus. Don't go back. Don't go this way. Don't fall prey to, to this area to where you begin to question your faith and, and, and you, you begin to respond to those, those doubts, if you will, by going backwards. Listen, we are all going to have questions in our walk with Christ. There are going to be those moments. There's going to be those Bible passages. There's going to be those experiences that we'll even have in the framework of fellowships, if you will, that it's like, wait a minute, if God is, then how can? Yes, that's a normal part of us walking, but, 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 but it does not change who God is, and it does not change what God came to do. It doesn't change any of that stuff, and we have the same questions to ask. And now the temptation of these guys, once and again, will they remain in Christ or will they doubt? Will they go back? Will they give up? Will they, will, will they move to this place to where they take the truths that they've heard about Christ and minimize them according to the, well, the data and the science that is set before them? I mean, because this is what they have. Now, that is not a play on our cultural moment right now, but it's a very real thing that is put before each one of us because these are questions that you and I have to ask. Because our world around us, no matter what age you live within, is always going to have some data and always going to have some, some type of thing to minimize the experience of followers of Jesus Christ. What God has given to us is, is, is that we are walking in a walk by faith. And that does not mean a leap into a blind chasm. What it does mean is complete dependence upon a God who has created the world, who has proven himself trustworthy, and that is reaching out on every given moment to every single human being that still has breath within their lungs. That's what it means, that God is real. And we can preach that with passion. We can believe that wholeheartedly. And I want to make sure that I capture your attention here before we dive into this message this morning. And if you're visiting here, God bless you and thank you for being here. But really, I'm going to speak to those of you who, who um, are here and this is, your, this is your home church. And this message is going to speak to the heart issue of a number of you this morning. And if you're not careful to allow God's word to minister to you through his Holy Spirit, you're going to miss these truths for your life. And you're going to miss what God wants to do for you, how he wants to help you in this moment. The extension of his help is, is, is exceeding far beyond what's going on right here within this room. And so we're going to have three big ideas to move through today. The first big idea is this, is that the door of rest. Uh, back in verses 1 through 7 here, this text that we just read out of Hebrews, that, that in these first seven verses, the door of rest is the, is the big idea. And in verse number one, we see that there is God's part to that. You know, God's part of the rest is nothing more than the, the promise that has been given. It is a promise of rest. It is what he has done. He's the only one that can bring that. He's the only one that can sustain that. He is the only one that can bring rest. What did Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but how? By him, right? That's it. It's only by him. And when we try to step around him and we try to step out a relationship with him and we get, we get stuck in these places and, and, and we find that God is reaching for us and, and he's trying to help us and he sends his people and he sends his love and he, he does all of this stuff and we continue to resist. Folks, that's why we have the Old Testament. That's the examples and the stories that we saw uh, with the Israelites as they fought God. Yes, they did religious things. Yes, they had some type of a religious be belief, but they never walked by faith. And, and may this message in Hebrews chapter four, uh, chapter four that the apostle Paul brings to the church today in, in 2022, may this shake you to the core of who you are in understanding that it's God's goodness that you remain and that you're only here in this place for God. It doesn't mean that you don't have a life, a wife and kids and things to do. You do, you do, you do and do them faithfully before the Lord. But it does mean that God is up to something much greater than your physical comfort. Than, than, than the promotion of your own pride and ego, if you will. 
And so God's part is the promise of rest. Now, as, as, as we look at these verses, we also see that there's our part. And, and that, that is, is that we're to remain in this place of this reverential awe, this reverential fear of him. This, this fear, is, it's a healthy respect for God. Why? Because when we step out of that respect and that, that, that reverence for God, we move into this place to where we experience the dire consequences of what is called faithless living. That faithless living is nothing more than, than disobeying the truths that I know that God has given to me, the, the, the truths that are, that are there, and then I know that in the core of who I am, in my conscience, I know that I should be, I should be living and walking this way and honoring the Lord with my life. And for the Christian, if we respond to this fear, if we respond to these particular things, then it steals us from what God wants to do. And God wants us to, to, God wants us to have a healthy fear to, towards him. Why? So that we would avoid the scars of stepping out of fellowship with him. Because that's what happens. We scar our life. To the Christian, I'm only speaking to the Christian here this morning, to the Christian that knows God and then pushes off and steps away from him because you've lost that fear, that reverence towards him, you bring scars, unnecessary scars into your life and you affect people that are around you. You're not the only one that has a scar. Your family will bear a scar. The church will bear a scar. And we don't always talk about that within church, but the door of rest is Christ and Christ alone. And the simple application that we can take away from this is that, 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 listen, church, that we are to have no confidence within our natural ability, our, our natural ability to approach God on our goodness. And, 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 well, I'm a good person. I'm not too bad of a person. I used to get participation awards when I was in school. Okay, that's all right. They didn't have those when I was in school. But we're to have no confidence in this natural ability. We're to avoid living contrary to his leading. Take a look at the screen for just a second. In Philippians chapter three, elsewhere, Paul says that we, we rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put no confidence in human effort. Our human ability to be able to approach God, to be good enough, we put no confidence in that. Because if it's of works, it's not of grace. It's of a grace, it's not of works. And there's a balance that is attached there. And quite honestly, uh, maybe we could say that this is where this is where the rub sets in. This is where the this is where the train wreck begins to come into our culture in 2022, and it collides with all of our human reasoning, because everything that we're taught since you know we start little kindergarten and we work our way through college or wherever we end up stopping, uh, maybe it's a professional track or whatever, that there is all this effort that we're we're taught to give and to balance your schedule better and to to you know to work harder and, and excuse me <laughs> work smarter not harder and all of these little uh, phraseologies and you know and fake it till we make it you know all of that stuff is there yeah we hear about all that stuff and we forget that it is it is a track that is entirely antagonistic to the gospel of Jesus Christ it's the humanistic thought of our day now, humanistic is a big word, and, and I'm sure there's a lot of political overtones within in that, and I don't mean it in that dynamic. I really don't. But I'll just give you the simple definition. I think you may even see it on the screen here of what humanism is. Uh, a little Google search, the very first one that popped up when I typed it in, and I just said define you know, uh, humanism, and here's what it said. It says it's a belief that stresses the potential value and the goodness of human beings. Now that flies completely in the face of what we know that God has spoken about mankind since the fall of Adam and Eve all the way down to our particular time. For the scripture tells us that there is none righteous, no, not one. Oh yeah, that speaks to us this morning. The scriptures revealed to us that the heart of man is desperately wicked. Yeah, that is us. And all of these truths come forward. And so, so when we look into our culture and we see the way that our little kids and little Johnny and little Susie are getting trained up these days, you know, under this, this humanistic thought process that everybody gets a participation award because we're so afraid to stifle them and, and to make them think that they're, they're less of humans in all of this. And, and, and we don't want to devalue them. And, and, and all of a sudden we open Pandora's box and everything goes at that point. And that's what you're experiencing right now.
But on the other side of the coin, if we want to enter into God's rest, we have to understand that it's absolutely necessary that we have no confidence within our flesh. None. It doesn't mean, again, that we can't do things because we have been gifted by God to do things. And we've also been given responsibility for the care of our families, for the care of our bodies, for the care of the stewardship of our homes and our finances. Yes, that's true. So don't go into this weird religious extreme of saying something that I'm, I'm not saying right now. I'm merely saying that human effort to make ourselves look good in the sight of God is a complete waste of time and it's a failure. And when we do that, we've bypassed what God desires to get our attention on. And, 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 and I understand that that might be Christianity 101. It might be salvation 101. Fine. The whole idea of these first seven verses is nothing more than understanding what the door of rest is. It's Jesus Christ. It's a very simple message to a people that were getting super confused about their time, the pressures they were experiencing, and the frustration that they had to walk within. Ugh, we can get that. We can totally get that. But it's a promise. Matthew 11, Jesus tells us this, a verse that, that many or all of you know. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. It is exhausting trying to be good enough. It's completely exhausting. It's his promise, though, that, that he invites us to receive, and it's not our goodness. It's not our, it's not our performance. It does not alienate us from, from walking holy lives, lives that are set apart to God, lives that are in obedience to God. It doesn't alienate any of that. It merely says that we just don't have to strive to be able to be able to approach God. No, no, it's given through a promise. Take a look down in your Bible. Go down to verses uh, uh, six and seven now. And I want to tie all of this stuff here together so that, so that the lights come on for us. In verses 6 and 7, one more time, he says that God's rest is there for people to enter. But those who first heard this good news, they failed to enter because they disobeyed God. So, God said another time for entering his rest. And that time is today. It's found in Jesus. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens. I will give you rest. The time is now. Now, God announced this through David, much later in the words already quoted. Here's what he said. Here's what he said to David. He says, today, when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. Don't harden your hearts. And what he is quoting from, take your Bible, Bible Olympics, turn back to your left to Psalm 95. It is so fascinating to see this because as he takes this out of Psalm 95, there is, there is there's a much bigger context that is going on. So he quotes David as saying these particular things, again, coming out of Psalm 95. Now, in Psalm 95, <clears throat> let me capture the verse or two right before this quote that he has in Hebrews. Psalm 95, verse number six, it says this. <clears throat> uh, he says, come, he says, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our maker. Oh, man, I love to sing that song in acapella. I just love that song. It just resonates, you know, with our hearts. He says that for he is our God and we are the people that he watches over, the flock under his care. Now, now, now he turns the corner a little bit. Check, check this out. He says, if, if only you would listen to his voice today, exclamation mark. The Lord says, don't harden your hearts as Israel did at Meribah, as they did at Massa in the wilderness. So he lays these things out here of saying, hey, it's action today. God's doing something. He's got a promise. He's doing it. The, the, the action of response is for you today. And the example of failure, it comes from the past, the Israelites. But, and, and here's the key to, to the, the offer or, or a healthy response. Back in verse number six, he says, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our God, our maker. It's right there in that English word that you and I are looking at as kneel. Kneeling before God. Here's the idea, if you're, if, if you're able to capture it, if you're able to, 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 to hang on to it, in the Hebrew, from this little word right here, the idea is to bend the knee, watch, stick with me, there's a physical posture that is representing an internal breaking down, i.e., surrender. That's it. 
Let us, let us kneel before the Lord our God, our maker. Let us understand that the work that God is desiring to do, which, which that is to draw us into this place of surrender, which, which allows him to provide us peace and rest. That's his promise. Ours is the response of fear, a response of reverence. That response of reverence, it, it penetrates to the core of who we are. It generates an external action that is reflective of that internal change that is going on. Hey, man, that almost sounds like New Testament baptism, huh? You know, that's, that's, what, it, that's what it's all about. And, and, and this is what's on the table here. And Paul is taking this stuff. Now we're all the way back in Hebrews again. Paul is taking this stuff out of Hebrews and he's bringing this to the believers that were wrestling with that idea about their salvation and everything that was going on within their culture and how it was leading them to pull back from that relationship with God. And they were drifting. They were passing by that relationship, the relationship with Christ, and they were taking their hands off. Listen, I've taught you guys this here before as as we kind of did a survey over Hebrews. We knew or we know today that when we look into Hebrews chapter 10, that the first sign of of what these guys did as, as settling in that relationship, coming to a standstill, was that they neglected the regular assembling of the saints and so which Paul put in, in, in Hebrews chapter 10, about verse 24, 25, right in that area, he says, don't do that. He says, encourage each other all the more as you see the day approaching. Do not neglect the assembling of yourselves together as is the custom of some. And that's what was happening to them. That they were going backward in a spiritual way and they couldn't figure out why. Now let's, let's translate that for just a second in our time right now, right here in 2022. Listen, if, if, if you're inclined to look at some of those church researches and the church surveys and all this stuff, you can, you can start quoting sites from, um, what's it, Ed Stetzer, uh, uh, Lifeway Research is one. You know, this is back about four years or so now, pre-COVID. It's worse as we stand right now. But the aspect of regular church attendance, what was, what was considered a regular Christian person going to church was once every six weeks. And people wonder why our, our country's in the condition it is. We wonder why our homes are in the condition they are. We wonder why, why we have no rest and why there's that internal angst that is always going on there. We, you know, we, we start questioning all of these things. Listen, it's not because God has pulled back his promise. It's because we've forgotten the basics of Christianity. And the basics of Christianity is on the first day of the week that the church would assemble itself. That's how it started in the book of Acts. That's what we see here later on in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10. There is that warning that comes out. There's that exhortation that Paul gives. He says, he says don't run yourself aground here. Don't go into this place to where you're shipwrecked understand that God desires. He knows how frail you are. He has a promise for you. But in order for you to live in that rest, that hope, that peace on a regular, ongoing, and continual basis, then, then, then you need to stay close. You need to stay close. And, and, and showing up to church once every six weeks or, or once a year or whatever, praise the Lord that you're coming on those particular times, but do recognize that you will be in a weak spiritual condition. And now I know that, that, that this is a church that is filled with cantankerous people because you're a bunch of sinners, just like me. So I'm in good company and so are you. So I'm not using this word to beat you. I'm not using God's word to get up on a high hobby horse or to, to go passionately down some, some trail that, you know, thinks that, you know, uh, by heavy and hard words that it's going to sp- stir up righteousness. It doesn't. It doesn't at all. But my responsibility and my call before the Lord is to be a pastor and a teacher. Is to teach you what God's word says, to give you the applications, to help you to apply them, and then to encourage you to do them. That's my responsibility as a pastor. That's my call as a pastor. And there are some of you that are hearing my voice, whether it's in this room, on the television, or listening on the radio. Well, I don't, I don't need to show up to the church to have a relationship with Jesus. Of course not. Of course not. And that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is in order to stay in obedience in a healthy relationship and have a, that reverential fear of God where you're walking close to God and you're not just saying religious things, is that you must stay close. That's what the Bible teaches us. Well, I can do the same thing in my home you know, with my neighbor next door and our dogs and we can have our coffee and do that. Yep, that's a great small group. 
But the reality of it is, is that the Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 14, is, is that you know, the membership to the body of Christ, it's a much larger thing than what you do in your living room. And the distortions that have flown across our country because of COVID and live streaming and all that has moved once again into the strategies and the, and the tactics of Satan to minimize the people's understanding. As the body of Christ, we assemble on Sunday mornings every year, every week. Why? It's not for you. Do you realize that it's for the person sitting next to you? Do you, do, do you realize that, that, that as God speaks to us corporately like this, that we are to have large group involvement with small group accountability? So sitting in your living room and watching TV with your friend or doing a Bible study with your friend, that's an amazing thing. You need that accountability. Awesome and amen. But don't neglect the greater aspect of this, of putting your faith into gear, assembling with the saints, as is the tradition, the custom, the practice, the call for the churches to get together and to watch what God does because you think that you pass the, the next happy plastic person walking through the door and it's like, yeah, yeah, they're all right. I'm okay. Everything's good. Yeah. Let's don't ask any questions. You ask one question and the person next to you falls apart. They start crying. I thought, I thought nobody would ever ask me that. Can you pray for me? And God had that divine appointment for you, not the pastor. It has nothing to do with the pastor. The pastor's job is only to teach you what the scripture has to say. It's your job to choose. Who are you going to follow? Are you going to follow Christ? Are you going to implement a biblical Christianity? Are you going to fall to this natural ability, this humanistic thought, this, this watered-down, weak, I don't even think you can call it Christianity anymore, uh, you know, this, this, uh, you know, all these liberal theologians and this, what is called this liberal um, uh, Christianity today supports, you know, uh, you know, it, it, it supports abortion. It supports same-sex marriage. It, it, you know, it's in line with gender dysphoria and all of those crazy things. And they're calling it Christianity. It's all under the vein of liberal Christianity. And maybe that's the defining point here. It's lunacy. It's not biblical Christianity. It's not following Jesus Christ. And all of a sudden you give messages like what comes out of Hebrews chapter 4 or, or, or even some of the words that I'm giving to you here this morning. It's like all of a sudden you're, you're creating a civil war because of these wards. It's because we've lost our bearings. We've lost our direction. Well, that leads us to the second idea, which, is, which goes much deeper than what I've already shared with you. This is just nothing more than dealing with the open door, that door to peace, that door to the promise, the door to rest. The second idea in verses 8 down through 13 is the word exposes my condition. Let me read a few of the verses to you, and then we'll, we'll dial in on the main point for us as the church today. He says in verse number 8, he says, Now, if Joshua had succeeded in giving them rest, God would not have spoken about another day of rest still to come. And so there is a special rest still waiting for the people of God. For all who have entered into God's rest have, have rested from their labors, just as, as God did after creating the world. So let us do our best to enter that rest. But if we disobey God, as the people of Israel did, we will fall. For the word of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. And he is the one to whom we must give account. Hmm. Well, uh, let's, let's lift our sights just a little bit. Hebrews 4 and 12. That the word of God is alive, is living, is powerful. I mean, this has got to be one of the most popular New Testament verses that there is within the, in, in, in the New Testament scriptures. It, it, it's, it's so familiar, if you will. And we quote it so often. We quote it so frequently. And, and, and really, we have no idea, no understanding of how and why we're quoting it. And, well, it sounds good coming out. And, and honestly, it is good for sure. But there's a very specific intent that God has and, and he used in the Apostle Paul to write this, to give this to the church, both then and now. It's a very specific intent. This verse is one of those verses that, 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 that it helps us. It helps to retard those, those things that hinder our growth spiritually. That's what this verse does. When we understand how God has gotten so pointed with this, it, the, the point in this is to give you and I a, a basic understanding of the healthiness of life. It's simple. 
And what was going on with these folks here in the book of Hebrews and what's happening in this fellowship and the churches in America and, and really around the, gro- the, around the globe, the same thing is true. That when sinful conditions are allowed to linger within our life, in the, in the case here in Hebrews, it was unbelief, it was rebellion, it was pride, it was, it was these places where they just pushed off of, of fearing God. There's no reverence towards God. That's what they were wrestling with. It could be many more things, but that's what they were in the middle of. But the point is the same. You put the label on the sin that you want it to be, but the point is exactly the same. It said that all of these things here are major roadblocks to, to both our growth and our rest in Christ. They're roadblocks. Take a look at the screen. I like what one commentator said about this passage. Uh, a gentleman, uh, pastor, commentator, uh, Charles Swindoll, in his commentary, he said this. He said that it's as if the author of Hebrews was saying, all right, everybody, stop. This lingering condition of a callous heart has dogged your spiritual progress long enough. It's time to take care of it once and for all. Man. Man, does that not speak to you this morning? Can we not grasp that God sees and that God cares? Can we not grasp that? But those things that get in our way, the things that prohibit us from, from, from you know, moving into a healthy spot, from, from exercising a reverence or this healthy fear towards God is lingering in places of, of self-pity. You know, and what happens with self-pity? You stay there long enough, the next thing you know, you're melancholy. You're depressed, man. And then the next thing that happens after that, there is a spiritual lethargy that is upon you, if not a physical leper- uh, uh, laziness. Let's be simple. Lethargy. It's upon you. You're stuck. God doesn't want us to be stuck. He doesn't want us, as this commentator said, he doesn't want us to be dogged in our spiritual condition. He says, he says, stop. This has got to stop. So how do we do that? Well, it's God's word. His word is living. His word is powerful. His word, what does it do? It cuts right to the core issue. Look at your Bible one more time. In your Bible, Hebrews chapter 4 and 12, uh, I'm reading from NLT, which says that, that it's sharper than a two-edged sword, cutting between. In the, in the New King James, it uses the word piercing between soul and spirit. Okay, here's the idea. Just understand this. It, 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 it's a medical term, same Greek word. It, it's a medical term that describes opening up a person into the deepest part of their body. And you can say, okay, I get that, right? I kind of thought that, but yeah, I get that. Do you? Because the soul and spirit, God's word separates those things that are temporal from those things that are eternal. The things that are eternal are by his spirit. His word tells us, and his word, right, we say this. We're real good at saying this. Psalm 119, 105, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a flashlight. It's a lamp to my feet, and it shows me where I'm supposed to go. Yes, yes, and amen. All he's saying here is, is that God's word, it goes down into that deepest part of your being. It, it, his word penetrates every fiber and when my eyes and my ears and my heart are open to him, he keeps me in that place of health. But when I close my eyes, when I shut my ears, and when I turn my back on God, then I move into the other thing. But God's word is, is designed, and even like it's going out here this morning, is to cut right down to the core of who we are. It's the conviction that comes to our conscience and leads us into this place to receive that fresh promise. That fresh rest from God. Not performance-based Christianity, man. That's not what he's talking about. And he says that not only does it do with the soul and the spirit, it also does the, the joints and the, the marrow. Well, what in the world is that? I read it, I understand it, but it's not something that, that I can like really speak in depth about. Marrow. This is where health is generated. Think about bone marrow. Think about our body. Think about this verse. Listen, when, when, we, when we start talking about bone marrow, do we understand that our bone marrow, that it, that it contains the stem cells that develop different healthy things within our body? It's the stem cells. Right there at the core of who we are. In our bone marrow, we get, this, we get like the, 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 the generation of red blood cells. And what does that do? It carries oxygen throughout our body. There's the generation or the production of white blood cells that happen there. Well, what comes from that? It fights infection. 
And then we have the platelets. And what's that all about? Well, when I suffer a wound or, or, or I start bleeding, well, the platelets help with the blood clotting. So he's saying that God's word, it's a medical term. It opens a person's up into the deepest part of who they are. It separates soul and spirit, the things that are temporal from eternal. It goes all the way down to the joints and the marrow. It gets down right there to that very centerpiece of who you are or where health is generated. Red blood cells, white blood cells, the platelets and all that stuff. And, 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 and the illustration or the picture that he's drawing for is completely amazing. Now let's find how it, it attaches. Turn to Proverbs chapter 3. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 7 and 8, again, a section of scripture that many Christians are familiar with. But here's what he tells us in Proverbs chapter 3. It'll also be on the screen if you can't find it in your Bible here. Proverbs 3, verse 7 to 8, it says this. He says, he says don't be impressed with your own wisdom. He says, instead, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Then you will have healing for your body and strength for your bones. This is a hard scriptural truth to share. But some of you in the church are tottering back and forth in these places of sickness. And it's because that you've taken what God has is, is, is said is sin and you've recategorized it as no big deal. We know that that is a, a truth that Paul gave to the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, right towards the end of the chapter, that, that passage of scripture that deals with the communion table for the saints. That, that we are to take a look at ourselves in light of God's word, oh, in this particular case, the piercing of God's word all the way down to the deepest core of who we are, even to that point of our bone marrow, right there. Nothing is hidden from God. It's all open and exposed before him to the one that we must give account. And we recategorize things within our life. And, and, and Paul says that because we're not, we're not paying attention, because we're not applying these truths to our life, there are some that are weak, there are some that are sick, and there are some that, are, that sleep. That is death, by the way. And it's all because we make light of our sin. We don't repent from our sin. We make an excuse for our sin. We blame somebody else. I got a participation ribbon, so I know I'm good. I'll give myself 12 affirmations in the mirror here this morning. I'm going to keep on going. Meanwhile, stuck in sin, stuck in rebellion against God. And, and, and the simple message about the simple things not only about what Christ offers and what Christ assembles his church for on a weekly basis and the things that Christ sends us out to live by way of his character, his light living in us and through us to, to be witnesses for him in this world. You know, it didn't say put us on a stage to preach. That's my job. That's not necessarily yours unless you're a pastor and a teacher. But it is to make disciples. It is your very life and, and, the, and the relationships that you have that you can express care to another human being and just simply live the Christian life. But we recategorize things and we fall into tough spots. And I don't know who God is speaking to here in this second service, but I know that the first service that God did an amazing work and he spoke to many hearts there. Because it's all because he's faithful and he wants to deal with it. He wants to take these things out of our life that are, that are causing us harm. He wants to be like that master surgeon that takes this, this short little knife that we're talking about here and goes right into where the cancerous material is, where the dead material is, and he wants to carve it out without destroying the other stuff around it so that we can return to a spiritual health. That's what he wants. He, didn't want, he doesn't want you or I to flog ourselves. He doesn't want us to move to this place to where I, you know, I, I spend the next 24 hours kicking myself because of what I did. He wants us to recognize what we've done he wants us to realize that, that our way was in opposition to him, and he wants us to change direction. That's it. Just be honest before God. It's not that hard. Or is it? I think it is hard because it cuts right down to the core of what I'm going to choose. It's called a walk of faith. Will I submit to God and obey God, or will I refuse God? Will I resist? And week by week, we share as we travel through the scriptures, we see the heart of God revealed. We see the call going out to man. We see the call to repentance. We see, we see God giving the action steps of how to live the Christian life, to stay healthy, to stay close, to do these things. And, and, and they're all there. 
And while there's a general theme, there, we get to these areas like, like today about God's word being alive and living and that it's, it's able to pierce to such a great degree. He even goes on farther and he says it exposes, that God's word exposes our inmost thoughts and desires. Well, how in the world does that happen? Listen, you spend five minutes with somebody. I'm a pastor. And all of a sudden, the stuff that comes out of people's mouth towards me, what I hear in passing here or other places, people just have an ability to share and they open their mouth. And guess what the Bible says? That the mouth speaks out of the abundance of the heart. You want to know where people are at? Spend a few moments with them and you'll see where they're at. You want to know where you're at? When you're at home, put a recording onto your phone and listen to how much you complain. I'm not the only one, huh? <laughs> I, I'm not laughing at sin. I'm just, I'm just going, oh my goodness. Yeah, that's humanity. And God doesn't want us to hold us there. Why? Because his word, it judges our motives. His word judges our attitudes. His word judges our intentions. And you know what it all brings us to? It, it brings us to this third and final idea, which is super short. Here's the idea. Jesus is my help. So think about that. So, so think about the flow of this message. We're, we're, we're looking at Hebrews chapter 4. We're asking and trying to answer the question, why can't I find rest? We come to the first big idea in the first seven verses, and that is nothing more that, that Christ is the door of rest. It's what he offers to us. It's the promise he's given to us. We, 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 we go to the, the center section of this particular chapter, and we realize that it's God's word that exposes our condition because he wants to help us. And now we're, we're coming to the concluding two verses, and that is, is Jesus is my help. Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 15, here's what it says in fancy language, and then I'll define it for you. In fancy language, it says this. He says, so then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. Here's the, here's the translation. Actually, let me read you one more verse, and I'll give it to you. Um, he, says, he says, this high priest of ours understands our weakness, for he faced all the same testing we do, yet he did not sin. Here's the translation. Jesus gets your struggle. He gets your struggle. You, you might think that it's strange and obscure and, and something that is only to you, and well, you didn't have what I came from, and your parents weren't this way, and, and your siblings weren't that, and you didn't get this short end of the stick. Okay, I agree. But your test and your comparison is not me. What, what your test and your comparison has to, has to come against is what God says to you. And what God says to you is that he understands that your struggle is real. God understands that. He gets your struggle, but he doesn't leave you or I there in our struggle. What does he do? Check it out. Verse number 16, he says this. He says, so. So because he understands our struggle, so. What are we to do? Here it is. Let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. Because he understands our struggle, he's not repelling us. He's invited us to come. He came to seek and to save. He's not pushing you off. He's not pushing me off. But will you get out of the way of yourself? That's a question I have to ask me because I, you know, I'm a type A person. Listen, if you're visiting this church, it doesn't take long to see that. Okay, this guy's stinking intense. Yep. And it's not just on Sunday morning. I live like this. My poor wife. The past 37 years have been a nightmare for her. Bless her heart. Although she's getting way more intense now. See, you know her. He says once again, verse 16, he says, so, so let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. Did you, did you see that gracious God? I know these are simple truths. I understand that. Well, well, Paul wasn't trying to give them something crazy, but he was just using the language of the day of what they understood. They understood the Old Testament way better than you and I ever will. They were much closer to that. They understood the aspect about high priest. They understood the aspect about Moses' law. They understood, they understood, they understood. For you and I, these are not some of the, the, the regular phraseologies of our day. But the end result is still the same, and that is, is that we're drawing upon God's grace. It's unmerited, undeserved favor, and God's inviting you to that. Every morning, His mercies, His compassions are new. Lamentation chapter 3, it tells us that. It, you know, it, it's the enduring promises of God from the time of creation through the Middle Ages all the way to this present moment and until Christ returns for the church. It, it's the same. He says, there we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help, to help us when we need it most. That's God's promise.
And when he tells us that we're to, to approach and we're to speak boldly, you know, the, it, it, it's a simple idea. We have to open up and to speak honestly to God. If you hate the guy over there, say straight up, Lord, I hate that dude. I'd like to punch him in the mouth because of the heartaches that he has caused me. Now, you may not use UFC language like I'm using right there, okay? But I think you understand the core motivation. Sometimes we like to encouch our problems and these things. Well, Lord, I really don't care for this man as much. And, uh, you, know, you know, we try to make all this flowery stuff. It's like, no, dude, be honest. You would stink and run that guy over if you wouldn't get in trouble, you know? And that's the language of 2022 right there. Just be honest before God. That, I hope you can understand the hyperbole behind that, okay? Don't think I'm running people over in my car. I don't mean it like that. I would have ran you over. <laughs> my wife would have ran me over. <laughs> we just speak honestly about the struggles. That's it. Now, let me give the context of this chapter here before we close. One moment before we close. The context that we have within this chapter. Again, it's all pointing to the rest that is found in salvation. Yes. And that salvation is demonstrated through obedience to Christ. So the chapter, chapter 4 of Hebrews, what was given to these believers at this time and was given to you and I this morning, it is a chapter that points to the rest that is found in salvation in Christ alone. Period. And the demonstration that we have that rest is obedience to Christ. And so we started with a question or we started with a title. Maybe we'll close with that. Why can't I find rest? That's personal to you. You, you make the, the you, you know, you, you give that phrase. Why can't I find rest? Listen, the main reason that many Christians, they, they don't have rest is because there's an appearance of righteousness. It's like, much like the uh, Pharisees of the day when Christ walked the face of the earth. But there's all this religious stuff, and you carry a good Bible, perhaps, but you're not submitted to him in your heart. And thus, there's always that question. There's always that wrestling. I gotta do more. I have to this. I have to that. And you fall prey to what Satan wants to set you up with, and that is to run harder. And you get on this thing of, you know, having to emotionally build yourself up with affirmations or, you know, doing more things at church. You know, you're already doing 90% of the work and you want to add 10 more percent to that. It's just a reflection of a sick heart. And that was the problem that Israel was having. Because it was during that 40 years of wandering within the wilderness, God was there. God was providing. Remember, their sandals didn't even wear out for that course of time. God helped them with everything that they needed for, for life. God helped them. But what was the problem? The problem was is that they rejected the basic steps of faith and they lived in continued disobedience. And God says, nope, you will never enter my rest. Never. And if I can have the worship team come back up here on the stage, and we're going we're gonna to give this a run. I don't know that anything has changed, but if it hasn't changed, the direction that we'll go is we'll play really loud, unplugged with your guitar. And, uh, uh, and, 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 and we, might even, uh, we might even minimize bass and drums if that doesn't work. It might work this time. Might not. And feel free to give her a strum while I'm wrapping down here and see what happens. Mm-hmm. I'd like to have you guys close your Bibles, and when you're finished, if you, would, uh, if you would stand to your feet with me. Um, I know that I have I've shared with you guys over the course of time, and I have taught you that, uh, again, for those of you that this is your, this is your church, everybody's welcome, by the way, but for those of you that are, that are here, that are, um, you know, that are, that are walking in, in this place as, well, I'm your pastor. Remember, I've shared with you that participation in the sanctuary is you taking your Bible and opening your Bible and following along. It's participation. It sounds good, Vince. Keep going, buddy. That's it. That's your part of participation. But when we also come to the end and the closing of the, the, the service here, like right now, remember all of these things that we've shared from, from 
uh, from Hebrews chapter 4, all of this stuff that we've learned, the stuff that's, that's gone out here, these things are for us to apply to our heart, to our life, in, 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 in that we would come face to face with the goodness of God, that, that we would respond to God. And I, I, I want to ask you plainly and openly, listen, if you're a Christian, if you're a non-Christian, if this is your regular place or if you're just visiting here, it doesn't matter. God's word is God's word is going out. Listen, if God has spoken to you today about an area of disobedience, will you please raise up your hand so we can see you? Raise your hand and hold it up. Don't be, don't be shy. Be, be open and honest before God. Look around. You're not the only one. The whole church everywhere, people are, are they're sensing the work. You put your hand down now. The whole church is sensing the work of God. The whole church is. Other folks, they're not sensing it. And it's because they've shut their heart off to God. I'm not calling you out. I'm making a biblical statement that that is, that is the reality from God's vantage point. And what God wants us to recognize in the simplicity is to be transparent. And in that transparency, we receive rest. And that's all I'm sharing with you guys here this morning is what Hebrews chapter 4 tells us. And so, Father, as we, uh, as we conclude our time here, I know, that, I know that you're always calling us to come to the altar, to come to the altar of your grace that we can receive that hope and that forgiveness ascends. And I pray over this body of believers, uh, for the men and the women that are here, that uh, for these that, that are the dozens of, that have raised their hand, for the dozens that haven't raised their hand, I'm praying for them as, as people that you love, that you care about. And I'm asking, Father, that your goodness and your grace would wash down over their lives and that you would give a fresh start in, in, in the new hope and the rest that is only found in Jesus Christ. And I pray that as we sing this last song, we lift our voices to you about the reality of what you offer to us. I pray, Father, that you would give us a freshness of your peace as we go into this week. And we do thank you for this time, and we do thank you that your word, it pierces us. It cuts right down to the core of our issue. And We lift this up, Father, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said,